Chrome Pipes and Pinstripes, episode 208, Kevin Tates. All right, folks, hello and welcome to episode 208 of Chrome Pipes and Pinstripes. I am your host, Roy Boy, from RoyBoyProductions.com. That's a website where you can find hot rod and custom car show photos from all over the country. Over 100,000 images from car shows and magazine shoots and 48 Cars, 48 State Road Trip, the book shoots, and you can buy that book on the website. Hint, hint. All that is there on WordBoyProductions.com. And of course, that is where all this podcast network lives as well. Network. It's one show. Not really a network. Anyways, this episode, I think you're really going to enjoy the guest. I know, I know you know who he is. If you, want, if you don't know the name, you know the voice. If you don't know the voice, you know the face. He has been on all kinds of TV shows over the years, always showing people how to do things, how to work on their own cars, our own vehicles to make them better. And it's been a pleasure to talk to him. I hope you really enjoy this. And I'll catch you on the flip side. Well, folks, on the podcast this time, I've got a guy who... For the better part of my adult life, I kind of remember seeing him on TV. <laughs> so it's been kind of it's kind of cool to, to be able to sit down and talk to him tonight and uh, get to talk a little bit about that. Welcome to the podcast, Kevin Tates. How you doing, Kevin? Man, I'm doing good, Travis. How are you? Thanks for having me on. Oh, well, thanks for being here. I, I'm great. I'm great. Uh, so like I said, it's been a while that I've been watching on TV. It's hard. To, it's kind of hard to remember uh, when it first started. What was your first experience in the television business? First experience in television, um, way back in the Wayback Machine, I was a walk-on guest on the DIY network in a show called Classic Car Restoration. And okay. they needed a, a paint expert uh, talking about long-term storage in a vehicle that they had resurrected uh, for one of their series. And that led to uh, when they were casting on DIY for a new show, um, I ended up, I, I didn't suck on camera cause I already had my own <laughs> video production company. So right. I already knew what to do. I had been doing paint education videos since 1999. This is 2003. So, um, you know, so it was, a, it was, um, an environment I was familiar with. So, and I, I, I know my subject matter. I've got a solid right. foundation as a, as a, a technician. I would work for years in collision and restoration and, and all that stuff. So I'm confident in what I know how to do as a technician. So those things combined, uh, it may be a good guest. And, and I'm proud to say that when they, um, they looked at all the candidates of the casting call, I got the gig. I got my first series on the DIY network, man. It was nice. really cool. Yeah, yeah. It was a show called Classic Rides, and okay. uh, we did iconic vehicle restorations. We did three really cool projects um, uh, and, and three seasons on, on that show. The first one was a 65 Harley Electroglide, mm -hmm. and uh, interesting year in Harley-Davidson evolution. The first year for, or the only year for both a kickstart and electric start, and the first year for electric start in those bikes. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we got to do the full restoration. I got to have one of my heroes on as a um as an expert in in that show is ron covell i know you know who yeah. ron covell is and he and i become really good friends over the years because we kind of occupy the same space with our instructional products but right. we don't compete with each other so we can be buddies and we can you know talk shop and and i can go to his seminars and he can come to mine so it's turned right. out to be a really great friendship so i i had I was able to get Ron on as a, as a guest and we built an Indian motorcycle fender or we, I, I watched over his shoulder as he right. built it. Anyway, so we did three seasons on DIY um, with me hosting classic rides. The second series or second season was a Airstream trailer, a 24 foot Airstream. And the whole story of Wally Byam and the, and the whole thing was fascinating to me, you know, cause I'm a muscle car guy. And I'm a truck guy, obviously, too. But when we went for, you know, Harley Electric God first season, it was like, yeah, man, yeah, cool. We got a cool bike. And then they said, okay, well, next season, it's an Airstream. I went, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I know those. Yeah, the, yeah, the, the Chrome trailers. What? So, but the more I dove into it, the more that I really, really was fascinated by the story, not only the entrepreneurial journey of Wally Byam, who started Airstream, yeah. but also the whole history and the, the following that Airstream still continues to have to this day, yeah, it, right? It's a rabid following. I mean, those, those people are in it. They are in it. And you're more in the traditional hot rod realm. And yeah. you see these guys um, with, with the, the, the Bambis, the really small single axle trailers yeah. that are just completely retro, completely deco, really interesting, um, you know, because it's, it's total throwback. It's like a Model A hot rod. 
It's yeah. total throwback. And it's a wonderful thing to see that happening too. So it's still, like as, like I said, it's as, as alive and fervent now as it always has been. So Airstream was really kind of cool. Yeah. So and, yeah, oh, go ahead. Right. I'm sorry. I was going to say, but over the years, I mean, you've, you've been a part of a bunch of different shows. Uh, plus I've seen you in Eastwood videos. Of course, I've yes. seen you in uh, a handful of other videos, you know, just online stuff. Um, and then, like I said, you've got the, you've got the paint, education, paint education series since, was it yep. 93? 99. Um, 99. Yeah. Yeah, 99. That was my okay, first. Uh, and, and Eastwood was my first distributor. I was trying to sell them onesies okay. and twosies, and I finally figured out my market, which is a hobby guy, right? Yeah. And Eastwood was that. And I'll, I'll tell the story real quick. And I don't mean to take over the whole thing. No, but, that's fine. But that's fine. this story, I love telling this story because I was desperate. I was trying to sell them off the tool trucks and in the Napa stores yeah. that sold paint. And it's a fundamentals video. It's how to do a paint job. And it wasn't a Craig Frazier airbrush video. It wasn't like Von Dutch paint pinstriping. It was just a how to sand a fender and paint it video. And and I, out of, I used to buy tools from Eastwood. And I had an Eastwood paper catalog in front of me with the 800 number on. I said, damn it, I'm going to call. So <laughs> I called the 800 number on the front of the catalog. The lady answered. She said, can I help you? And I said, I've got a video that shows how to paint a car. You guys sell other videos. I think you should sell my video. <laughs> and she said, oh, okay, well, let me, to let me um, hold, please. I'll put you in touch with one of our buyers. Nice. She actually let that happen. I don't know that we could that could ever happen in, in, in this world. Right. But, but I was put in touch with a gentleman named John Sloan. He and I are okay. still friends to this day. And uh, and he said, well, send me a copy and I'll take a look at it. And uh, I did. And he called me back a few weeks later and said, we've, we've looked at this video several times. We really like it. We want to start selling it in our catalogs. Have you got any others? And so it was like, wow, bam, I've got a distributor. Then bam, bam, I've got, a, I've got a series now because I said, no, I don't. But give me a couple months and I'll have you right. another one. So, so that started the whole thing, which started the, the whole automotive media career for me, Travis. And it, it's been really interesting. Um, and I got, I got to speak on this, on uh, you know where the hell it is that I've come from and the path that I've traveled. Uh, not Just a few weeks ago at an entrepreneur's um, convention and... Uh, just you know, getting getting my whole presentation ready, it caused me to go back down memory lane and, you know, reminding myself of things like I couldn't afford to advertise. So Eastwood right. helped. I did pay jobs for Stacey David on trucks for free. So he would pr plug my videos. I made deals with regional car magazines where I could write free tech articles for them in exchange for vertical third and banner ads in the book, right? Plus the internal editorial I found out is really valuable real estate. So um, all of those things, it just caused this slow sort of a swell to the company that eventually led to television and grew my company. We started, you know, I would go to car shows and drag races with a TV and an inverter and VHS tape <laughs> and sit it on the hood and try and flag people down and say, hey, man, if you ever wanted to learn how to paint your car, watch this video. And and uh, just I, I guess the term for it now is side hustle. Right. But. You know, the whole time I was working full time in a collision shop and, okay. and restoration shops and managing shops and I own my own shop. And I never I never lost the fire for um, for really wanting to go further than where I was in that moment. You know what I mean? I know you right. share this because of, of, I did my research on you. And you're, <laughs> you're a busy dude, man. You're always on road trips and, and the photography thing and your, your podcast. Congratulations on all of your success, pal. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's, it's kind of the same thing where if you put enough time in on the side when you are doing other stuff all day long, then eventually it feels like you've accomplished something here you know and then and and some that, that snowball has to start rolling somewhere and everybody's like overnight success no it's always a no, snow, no 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 you know you're an overnight success when people understand about you i mean that part of it's overnight but it takes yeah. years of effort to get to that point well um, i like to look at it like some people can discover you overnight there you go yeah. but <laughs> but it, it takes it takes more work and so congratulations on that my, okay. my recipe has been a glacier pressure and time yeah. keep pushing keep pushing keep pushing. And when you get tired, rest for 30 seconds and then start pushing again, you yeah. know? Let's let's talk about the paint education series a little bit. I, you know, I went through a website and obviously, uh, I, I should say, uh, obviously nobody knows this, but yes, this conversation tonight kind of started because my dad, I was talking to him and I said, what do you want for Christmas? And he goes, you know, I kind of think I want a DVD on how to do some paint body work because I don't know if I'm ever going to do it, but I'd really like to see how to do it. And I said, well, I know just the guy. So I went over to the website. <laughs> And I ordered a, ordered a DVD, 
and uh, and he already knows about this, so he can hear that it, uh, hear that it's Christmas present. He already knows. And then uh, of course we started chatting. Um, the the paint education. I mean, you started off the DVDs, but you, I'm sure you lately have uh, have been pushing. You know, not pushing. And lately you have been feeling the push of society saying, well, DVDs aren't as important to us anymore as just getting the content to us. And most people want to do streaming. So I noticed you've got options for that now. Let's talk about that a little bit. How has that changed how you do things? Well, you know, just like when I started painting, we were transitioning from lacquer to enamels to acrylic yeah. enamels to acrylic urethanes to polyurethanes and now to waterborne. That evolution is constant. And it's the same thing with uh, consumable video. You know, when I started producing paint education, it was VHS. Nobody has right. VHS anymore. The Smithsonian does. But, and so DVD is the, the same way. DVD was a, a superior format because you could get way better video quality, more right. content on a little disc. Oh, so video, now uh, the, the laptop that I'm sitting here um, looking on does not have a DVD drive or a CD right. drive. So that technology is now obsolete as well. So if I'm going to continue paint education, I've got to continue to evolve the way I'm putting my information out. And as I've grown as a technician, as now an instructor and a qualified teacher, as a formal teacher, I've got an online trade school that I'd love to talk about. And, yeah. and I'm, doing, I'm doing formal courses as well. So the evolution of paint education had to happen or it's going to die. And I've got I've got too much invested in it. I've got too much great feedback over the years of people that have really, um, you know, I'm so proud to say that they've been helped by the videos, by putting the information out. So that's my driver is, um, you know, I believe we're put on this world to be of service in some way. And I finally figured out that maybe this is my way. So, um, you know, I, I truly love what it is that I do and passing information on and learning how to, to, to learn and to teach, you know, so those are, those are my drivers. That's my, my motivation. But what's happening now is really interesting for, um, for video. So my videos, as you found out, they're not, well, they're not free and they're certainly, they're not cheap, but they're expensive to produce. So we, we charge for them, but YouTube is now, it's the world's largest or second largest search engine. Right. And it is a incredible conveyor of video. Lots of really, really great video on YouTube. Everybody yep. knows this. So now YouTube has displaced um, uh, so a lot of the instructional video with distributors and things like that. So people are, are still wanting the content. Just like you said, your dad wants to know how to paint a, a, a car or a motorcycle. Everybody still has this thirst for, for this knowledge. They're just acquiring it in different places. Right. So my challenge as a video producer, as a content producer and an instructor is to find a way to, 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 to tap into those people. Now I can, I, YouTube also is free video. The video that I produce is extremely expensive to produce because I vet it out. I script, I, I don't script everything out, but, but I, I thoroughly, um, research all of the stuff that I'm doing. Right. And, and my new Page Education University is a formalized trade school type of a course, test outs after every module, proper PPE. The, it, this course could literally be transposed into um, a National Auto Diesel College or mm -hmm. a, uh, a trade school because I've, I've, I've really taken the time. As, as a matter of fact, I think I can talk about this out of school, but I'm working with <laughs> Exalta Paint and they're actually using some of my content for their internal training and vice versa. We've oh. got this great relationship going with Exalta and I, I think a, a lot of the company for a lot of different reasons, but, but it's a really neat thing. And it's because I upped my game. I went from enthusiast videos to uh, educational trade school type formats. And so that's kind of what's happening with paint education. I'll always continue to do enthusiast type of stuff. Uh, on my website, I've got a whole bunch of free videos. I've got the streaming videos, and some of them are right. like three bucks. Uh, one of them is called um, "Cab Corners for Ten Dollars" or something like that. And I show you how to <laughs> how to do do uh, yeah, and, and no weld cab corners with panel bonding adhesives instead of a welder. If you don't have a MIG welder, so, so that's up there, and it's a five dollar okay. video. So I mean, I, I, it's not like I want to I want to hold everybody hostage for the almighty dollar, but but you know, we, we kind of have to pay ourselves back for, for doing, you know, and, and yeah. part of the reason you sell t-shirts and you've got some swag and stuff like that. you got to keep the lights on, right? Exactly. Yeah. You got to keep, you've got to keep at least breaking even to continue producing stuff. And so it'd be nice to, to earn a little bit for your time and as well, but you know, right. for, for a lot of guys like my photography stuff over the years, the magazines, most of the magazines don't pay very much, but yes, I get to get I a buddy's this. car. You know, yeah. I get to go get a buddy's <laughs> car in a magazine. So his shop gets coverage. So 
I can go spend a weekend. Actually, there's a, a feature on the wall back here from Classic Trucks from a few years ago. I got to go spend a weekend with my buddy. I got paid to to shoot some photos, write some article, and he got a bunch of press off of it. And that's that's the yeah. most important part to me is I get to show off the hard work of people I know who otherwise wouldn't be get to show off get to show off. Um, so you kind of mentioned in there as you, as you were going through all the different kinds of paint supplies over the years, you know. Um, with the exception of, of course, how those how those lay down, how those are sprayed, it, there's probably. I guess my question is: Is there a, is there a lot of change that's happened from say the 40s and 50s and 60s when guys were building first hot rods and customs to like a guy building a Model A today? I mean, the process is, as far as I can see it, a, a complete layman is the same thing. You want a good base, you want to get your get your product your color down, and you want to get it smooth. And then now that there's clear coat, you want to get it on and get it smooth. Of course, back in the day with the single stage, it's probably a little a little easier, but. Uh, Overall, is the, the process is pretty much the same, right? It's just the details of how to do it, I'm guessing, is what's changed the most. Yeah, the process is basically the same. You're exactly right. You get your metal as straight as possible. Then you use your fillers. In the old days, it used to be lead. Up until 1952, right. lead was the body filler material. Uh, then plastics took over, and, and arguably they're way safer and superior in, in a lot of ways. Old school guys still like to work with lead, and yeah. that's fine too, but lead is a heavy metal. So it's, it's, it's as we learn more about chemistry and science in our bodies, lead is not a good thing to have carrying around in your liver. Right. <laughs> so, so now we don't use lead to repair anymore. So things like that have come along in the industry. And, and the materials have gotten better. And trust me when I say this, materials are so much easier to use these days. Oh, they really? really are. Um, it's, but the process is the same. The processes are, are the same. You know, spraying paint hasn't changed in over a hundred years. The first patent on a atomized spray gun tool is from the Sada company, Sada Spray Guns. Uh -huh. They're a German company, but they literally had a patent in, um, it was a 19, I'm sorry, 18, anyway, it was 102 years ago. Uh, <laughs> I can't do the math in my head. I suck at math. I, my numbers are backwards. Anyway, um, so it's been around a long time. And, you know, I, I always like to say when I'm teaching people that are gearheads, uh, you know, a paint gun is nothing more than a, a well-tuned carburetor. It's yeah. an atomizer. So it takes a liquid, mixes air with it, and turns it to a mist that becomes combustible. And in the, the case of paint equipment, it becomes transferable. We're not pouring out of the cup onto our fender. We're spraying it on through the air. And, you know, it's, and it, this is a universal law as well, or truth as well. It's up to the technician and the chemistry how well that material lays down. And that is that will that will never change. So that's the need for ongoing education. Yes, it's the same thing, but the spray properties of the materials as they change and grow and improve, sometimes devolve over the years. That is where we as technicians and teachers need to keep up with new technology and different spray techniques. Yep. Uh, it's been interesting watching a lot of builders these last couple of years who are now making the transition into waterborne. And mm -hmm. you know, first, there's a lot of griping because it's something new and something different. And maybe the fine tuning details of how to do waterborne versus solvent based, you know, maybe they don't know that yet. So oh, this, this doesn't work. I don't like it. Well, now here's a couple of years later, the same guys are like, yep, we switched completely to it and I'm happy with it. Um, yeah. Are those growing pains, I'm, I'm guessing they happened in each of the transitions over the years from lacquer. Absolutely, or, absolutely. Yeah. You just made me rem remember this great story. I was a shop manager and there was a, an older gentleman, um, Mr. Ingram, and, and he was an old school guy. He was in his late 50s at the time and I was way younger. And and we were transitioning from lacquer primers to, to polyurethane primers. But it's better technology. It dries faster, it dries harder. It doesn't get reflowed by, you can't spill. Anyway, it's better technology. And all the technicians were forced to change from lacquer primer, which he had been using for 35 years in his right. career successfully. And now we got to use urethane primer. And he, he got pissed off at me one day and he said, he said, I don't know what's wrong. You know, the, what this stuff was good enough for the last 30 years. Why is it all of a sudden not any good? And I said, it's not that it's not good. I had to, you know, I didn't have to explain to him like he was a child, but I had to remind him that everything over top of that primer, it's a, it's a stacked up layer. Everything over top of that lacquer primer was now modern chemistry. It was not, it was incompatible. I said, it's not that lacquer is bad. I said, it's just different than everything else we're putting on top of it. And it doesn't work anymore. And we sat down and I showed him, we talked and he was fine after that. But that was, 
you know, he's working on a flat rate. He's making his living. He's he's later into his career. He doesn't want to change. You don't right. want to move the, the peas on the on the plate. The carrots are over here now. I don't like all my carrots over yeah. here. And I don't I don't blame him. You know, I go through these these curves as well. But you know, once he got used to it, it's a it's a way better product. The cycle time, which is the amount of time that it takes a vehicle to be worked on and then move to the next station in the shop. Cycle times are crazily improved. And I, I'm, one last point on this particularly, I just went for a uh, certification class, my master certification up at Exalta Paint in Charlotte, which, by the way, is right around the corner from Charlotte Motor Speedway. We got a tour of some of the Hendrick engine shops. It was oh, it was awesome. Oh, I bet. <laughs> oh, it was fantastic, dude. We couldn't take pictures, and I was so PO'd. But um, I was in an aisle full of like $3 million worth of engines. It was incredible. Anyway, so we're at this, this trading center with Exalta. We're using a waterborne product. And where it would have taken me about three and a half hours to do a paint job on this particular panel that we were being instructed on, in and out, including clear coat and cycle times, was now an hour and 20 minutes. So your base coat application, you do, it's, it's a, a, a full coat and then a half coat and you're out with the same gun in the same time. The, the material is so sophisticated these days that your cycle time, which is really where the money is made in, in collision, uh, right. is, is decreased by more than two thirds. And it's really exciting. It's really interesting stuff. However, you clean everything with a different stuff. You spray completely differently than you used to. Uh, the whole gun technique is, you know, technique is technique. It's how you hold the, the gun against the, 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 the substrate or your, your fenders or whatever it is that you're spraying. But the way um, the way you spray it, you have to evolve with that stuff, and it's it's a heck of a learning curve. I looked like a boob the first time I tried to 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 um, to, to paint the stuff with the new waterborne stuff years ago. But it, it's necessary, and it's sometimes painful. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I've heard guys over the years say, "Well, you know, I I can paint this car, but you know, I'm going to primer it, and then we're going to let it set, and it's going to set for a week or two before I put." any color on it and then we yeah. got other guys going well no we'll, we'll get your car in and then you know full time full work time we're going to be about a month with all the body work and everything and so i've got guys tell me well this can't be right it's supposed to set for a few weeks before they can even paint it and i think that what that comes down to is a lot of guys have old processes in their head and maybe some of the new processes are able to speed up but they don't they still work the old way it kind of feels like yes you can't drag old techniques into new products so <clears throat> one of the things I do in person classes and um, for small volume stuff, I've got a, a discrete contract for people to come down to what used to be my restoration shop is now uh, and Tim Strange has been there is now my training center. And um, so we talk about um, the technical data sheets, every single product, whether it's Windex, whether it's dish soap or car paint has a uh, safety data sheet and a technical data sheet. Safety data is, is health related mostly and OSHA related mandates and compliance. Uh, technical data sheet is usage. So every product has a TDS sheet. And my biggest thing that I can pass on to my technicians that come through my courses are the TDS sheets and the importance of it because it tells you everything. You know, the instructions aren't very complete on the back of the can. And if you pour it wrong once, then you <laughs> paint pours down the side and covers up your label. So your technical data sheets um, are, are really the Bible to go by. They're the super guide to go by. And then you take your experience and then you take the prior knowledge and then you take what, what the surface is telling you and then your atmospheric reads, what temperature it is. Uh, all those things combined. But, uh, you know, if I can pass anything on to anybody listening, if you're doing paint and body stuff, and this is guys that are long in the tooth too, you guys know this. So I'm just going to remind you of this. Get your TDS sheets and read them. I have them open on my bench top. I've painted thousands and thousands of cars over the years. And um, my TDS sheets are out, if nothing else, for a comfort zone. If I get a phone call in between a flash time between coats, well, my time perception is just screwed. Right. So if I go too soon, I'm going to run it onto the floor. If I wait too late on some products, they're going to wrinkle up like an alligator pack. So the TDS sheet is really um, the, one of the best kept secrets that people don't really seem to realize. So um, if I can pass that on to anybody listening, um, <laughs> that's that's one of the biggest teaching. You come to one of my classes, we're going to talk about TDS. Well, and okay, so that kind of brings up thinking about teaching, thinking about classes. Uh, that's a, a, a little tip I didn't know anything about. 
I guy actually got me thinking maybe I, you know, if I ever do this, I should keep a notebook there. And when I do a certain step, look at the clock, write that time down so that I can plus 10 minutes or whatever the time is before I do the next thing. So I at least don't have to remember my head. <laughs> okay. Yeah, oh, shoot, yeah. We're coming right up on it. At least you can look down. And, oh, well, I've got two minutes before I've got to get this next thing ready. And so, yeah. This is the way my brain works. I think about that other stuff while, while things going on. Uh, so, okay, education. You've been doing that forever. And, yes. and and I see the two things that keep people, uh, that not keep people, the th things that slow people down for getting into our hobby are, number one, the cost. Some of these cars, you know, you used to be able to get a C10 pickup for square body for 500 bucks at Ran and Drive, Ran and Drove. You know, now you're five grand. Um, the cost is a big part of it. The other part of it is, guys, if you don't know anything, they don't know what they can and can't do. Um, so for, for that, thank you for all the years on TV showing people that you can wow. do this. You know, you, you can learn how to do this. This isn't magic. This is a process and you can learn it. So thank you for all your years doing that because I'm sure that's helped a lot of people get into this hobby and we need new blood. We need new younger people to get into it. I sure hope so, Travis. And thank you for saying that out loud. That makes me feel really, really great. Um, that's one of the best things that um, that I can be a part of is passing on skills. And you know, part of my motivation for that was these people that that when I said, "Hey, how did you do that?" or "Show me some tips on how to paint a car," I'd get these guys across their arms, go, "Hell no." That's up to you to figure it out. I had to screw it up and learn my own way. That's, now it's your turn. And I, I, I made the promise to myself in my brain, I will not be that. In fact, I will be the opposite of that. I will be the guy that you are not, you know, and, and some of these people are friends of mine, but that was, that was not what they were going to do. And I thought, you know what, if, if, if I can do this for three people, if I can mentor 10 people or 20 people, um, then, then my, you know, that, that's a wonderful thing to be able to do. Right. Yeah. So, you know, over the years, 22 years of paint education now, and how many TV shows? Hell, we did 10 seasons on trucks, over 240 episodes of the three seasons on DIY. I'm doing stuff for Motor Trend right, right now with Ian Johnson from Extreme 4x4 and all, all the stuff. Three seasons as a spokesperson for Eastwood. All the video stuff that I've been been able to be a part of, all of it is is how to in nature it's instructional it's informational and and it's it's truly what i've figured out i finally figured out what i want to do when i grow up i want to be a teacher so it's it's <laughs> it's awesome man so again thank you for for saying that out and um i appreciate it so you know the i want to go back to something that you said people are intimidated by this process not just because of the process yes it's chemistry but you don't have to be a chemist. All you have to do is make the paint happy on a droplet level, on the, you know, just simple spray techniques. I can teach you how to spray paint in three hours and you're gonna be proficient at spraying paint because it's a very simple procedure. The process, however, is complex and it's long and it requires uh, an understanding on a fundamental level of what it is that we're trying to do. And things like temperature, humidity, those types of things relate into it as well as technique and as well as using the materials properly. So it's this concert of information that has to happen in, in, in like each individual link of the chain, stupid, simple. The chain is a long, complex thing. Okay. So um, what I would say to people is don't be afraid to dive into it because it's really simple. If a guy like me can learn to be an expert painter, guess what? You guys can learn to be an expert painter too. So the other thing is that um, any anything can be taught. Anything can be learned. It's not a gift. And people say, oh, you've got such a talent for painting. And I bristle at that because it's not a talent. It's a skill. Skill is acquired. Songwriting is a skill. It's word mastery, and it's it's uh, those types of things. You know, uh, being being a, a machinist is a skill. You have to be taught the fundamentals first, and then you can become a machinist. A photographer is a skill. It's not a gift. It's not ordained from the universe. It's something that we can learn. And I want to encourage. If, it, it doesn't matter if it's paint and body, if it's plumbing, if it's you know woodcrafting. It doesn't matter. Figure it out. Learn. Feed your soul. Feed your brain. I would love you to learn how to paint. I'd love you to come to paint education and, and I can put you through paint education university and you're going to get a really great foundational education, but do something. So that's one of the coolest things that I've figured out over this for myself personally, is it really drives me to be in that weird comfort zone of, I don't know what the heck I'm doing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> at, at, in essence, if you're a gearhead, guess what? You're a problem solver and we all are. And that's the, that's what I love about hot rodding. 
is that when you get into an area where you don't know what to do, but you can figure it out because of your prior experience or because you're just not afraid. To, I'm not going to say not afraid to fail, but you're afraid of recovering from your failures. How does that sound? Yeah. So I, in my day job, I work at a hot rod parts shop. And it's amazing to me how many guys just want to call and have you give them the one way to make something yeah. happen. I yeah. Think, well, a lot of times we do have a solution for you, but, you know, I, I never have a car they make a lot. Every car I've ever owned has not been something they make a lot of parts for. You know, so if you wanted, you know, in the, in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, it was a, a Ford Ranger. Well, the S10 was way easier to lower than my Ranger was. You know, yes. and it just, it, it just kept going on. Every, everything I pick, I have to do the hard way. And it's like, sometimes you just have to figure out how to do it. But if you can have somebody who's been there, who's can t- teach you the fundamentals, it's probably a, a, a light year type leap ahead in how you get to the end versus, well, I don't know what I'm doing and I'm just going to wing it. Well, here's some fundamentals of how to try this stuff. Here's how you get yep. there. Um, it's, it's been funny listening to guys over the years talk. I've got a buddy who used to build custom vans in the seventies and they'd paint a whole van and do a whole interior for $400 total. Oh my gosh. Are you kidding me? And you got guys now going, well, I think it's going to be like five grand for materials to paint my car. Yeah. 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 And, and that's, that's not, you know, that's not even counting probably your, your, uh, sandpaper. That's not counting all the yeah, tape, your masking the tape at 10 bucks a roll. Yeah. Right. All that stuff is so expensive. Yeah. It's, but here's what I always say to people. You can, you can buy the materials, you can gear up for equipment and you can go through the learning curve and screw your paint job up twice, get it right on the third time and still be in it cheaper than you could farm it out. Yeah. And that's the truth. I've, I've tested that ratio. And here's <laughs> the other thing too. Um, I've, I've got a course coming up. It's outlined and we're going to shoot it. Uh, it's going to be on the Paint Education University platform, but it's going to be called um, the Side Hustle to Small Business. And over the years, I've learned, I've gone through estimating school, body shop management school. I've lost my ass in a body shop. I just about starved having my own shop. I've made all the mistakes, not properly billing customers. You, you come from the parts background. You understand overhead. Everybody has to make money. But, but we don't have to gouge people, but we have to learn how to keep our business alive. And what happens, what I see with a lot of guys that are trying to do paint jobs on the side is that they'll either give away their labor or they'll, they'll just trade money for materials. And it does two things. It keeps money. All you're doing is trade money. You're not keeping it in your pocket and it gives a perceived value to the customer. And the, you end up creating this atmosphere of a lack of respect from the customer looking at the technician, yeah. thinking that you're a bargain and a bargain has different things. So um, Maya Angelou says we have to teach people how to treat us. And, yeah. and, and we do whether it's in a negative way or whether it's in a positive, proactive way. So what I want to do with this course is give people a really good foundation of of how to properly value our time, because we have to, how to properly value the customer's input and when not to have input, how to properly bill and charge for materials so that we're not trading money, we're actually keeping some of it, and how to properly say no to customers, because sometimes it's not always a good fit, right? Right. So uh, I'm excited about this. And it's one of the things that I, I you know, I, I, it uh, occurred to me that I should be, you know, the technical stuff, I'll always do the technical stuff, but that stuff, that's something that I can pass on too, because I've made the mistakes and I'm, I'm excited to, I, I hope we can circle back when I've got that one launched and maybe we can yeah. talk again, not to yeah. invite myself over to your place, <laughs> again, but, but it would be cool. To, no, it'd be fun. It'd be fun to, yeah. to, uh, to do that. And there's, cause there's a, a couple of other courses that, that, that I'm, I'm going to start, uh, January one, we're going to have just an unbelievable 2022. So I'm stoked. So starting in 99, now we're 2021. Um, are do you still have some of the old material that you've shot that you still use, or have you gone back and reshot any of that early stuff or well, uh, as, how does as, that work as for you, you? As your dad's going to find out, I didn't always have short hair. <laughs> I've seen a couple <laughs> pictures and we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. So, um, <laughs> you know, technique is technique. And you touched on this earlier with your question about materials and, and things, you know, the, the procedure kind of stays the same over the years. So uh, I still sell some of the uh, instructional products that I've, I've produced sometimes even like 15 years ago, because the, the information is still valid. And I keep my materials generic uh, because there's so many options for paints and different types of things. I try and stick to categories and types of paint and just basic fundamental techniques. So. Um, so some of that stuff 
is is um, is still actually out there and available. Um, transversely, one of the things I like about the new digital platform that I'm on is I've got a 14 module course. That's Page Education University, and mm -hmm. each module is 15 to 20 minutes long. If technology changes, I can pluck that down. I can redo it. I can add to it and put it back up online again. And now my course is current and valid. As right. soon as I produce a DVD and author it, it's obsolete. It's set. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Yes, for sure. So as we evolve, as materials evolve, and as I we uh, software, oh my gosh, you know this. I mean, the capabilities of some of the software now is yeah. unbelievable. So, you know, that's one of the things where I'm excited about new material. But, but yeah, we're going to keep some of the old material still valid. And some of it's a little bit cringy when I go back and look at it. <laughs> when I go back and look at my first, the first scene that I ever shot with my own series on DIY Network, I look at it and I go, oh, you poor guy. I wish I could talk to you now. <laughs> hey, just going back and listen to the first few podcasts, they'll come on one time, or they'll, they'll come up in my random rotation and they'll listen to stuff on road trips. And my girlfriend looks over and goes, oh, it's an early one. It's like, turn it off. Turn it yeah. off now. I yeah. don't want to hear this. Mm -hmm. I don't like this guy's voice. I don't like anything about this. So No, but you, as you know, you got to get used to the sound yeah. of your own voice. You have to make friends with that because we don't sound in, in playback like we sound when right. we speak. And there's a lot of different reasons for that because we don't have the resonation in our body cavities, in our sinuses, in our head, giving us this false impression of how we actually sound. Yeah. And microphones are not as sophisticated as a human ear. So, yeah, it's this whole trick that we play on ourselves. We, we, we hear ourselves back. I remember the first time I, I heard myself in a recording studio in my music days. It was like, oh, no, I suck. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, before we talk about the music days, uh, so paintucation.com is a website everybody needs to go to if they want to have some more information about everything you've got going on. Um, uh, so for Paintucation uh, University for the yes. DVDs, uh, everything yes. is there, and and uh, that's how they can get a hold of you as well is through that website. Yes, um, through the website. And also, Travis, I want to say there's a lot of free content on there. I've got yeah. a YouTube channel. It's all free. There's some there's uh, Kevin's tech tips. They're all free. I, I don't charge for everything. I do charge for a lot of my instructional stuff because, like we said, I, I, I have to have a budget to produce more yeah. stuff. But there's cameras a lot of good <laughs> cameras are expensive and microphones, too. Yeah. So um, but there's a lot of good free information out there, as there is on YouTube. And I'm, I'm not saying only me. But, you know, I've got structured courses if you're looking for that. But there's also some great YouTube videos from other uh, content providers as well. The, the point is just learn. Come to me. I'll give you the tech support, all that type of stuff. But get out there and, and learn something new, you know? Yeah, yeah. That, that's, a, that's a good way to finish up this little part because now we're going to talk about something a little more fun. Okay. So when we talked about first getting on here, I was like, okay, well, who do I know that knows Kevin? I was like, okay. Oh, Chris no, Ryan, you talk to Tim. Chris Ryan, <laughs> Tim Strange. And of course, I've seen videos when you were with that, uh, doing stuff with Eastwood with Matt Murray there. So I texted all three yep. guys. I was like, you guys have any good stories we need to talk about? Chris Ryan, I, I'm going to say it was a whole five seconds after I texted him, I got a reply back. And he goes, you know about Nova Rex, right? <laughs> I said, um, no, I have no idea what you're talking about. And he sent me a link to a documentary. He sent me some photos. So before you were making videos on 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 paint series and, and, and educating people how to paint you were in a band uh yes let's talk about that for a little bit because you know i i worked in the recording studio for a lot of years so i've been around really? a lot of bands over the years so uh I, I you know i know a little bit of the backstage side of a lot of bands I worked as, as a stagehand for 25 years as well so i've been around a lot of bands so let's talk about that band uh what was what was where how that all start Nova Rex was one of probably six, I'm going to call them successful working bands that I was in in my tenure. I started playing music when I was 13 years old in bars in Western Canada. I was a bass player and a singer and uh, recorded our first record when I was 15. Oh, wow. And it, when I listened back to it, it was terrible. But boy, it was a fun experience, man. And time, the people like, that I am kiss, you know, you are. <laughs> well, here's an interesting thing that happened. You're a recording engineer. So we thought we were all of that. We're in there. We're in the studio. So between takes and kind of after like a long day, because it took us about 10 days to record for 12 song, whatever it was on the LP, it was vinyl. Um, the, the, um, Fran Thieven was the engineer's name. He said, Hey guys, I want you to listen to this. So he puts on in the studio monitors, videos of tower of power live videos of of uh, 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 cool in the gang live of like miles davis records of of these musicians true musicians artists artists and it was one of the most humbling 
but amazing things that ever happened to me as a musician because it was like it was a gentle smackdown but at the same time it was an education as well because this it, it showed me what was possible as a musician because okay. we were doing chunk of chunk of chunk of one three five and and trying to do copies and covers and some clunky originals that we wrote and and all of a sudden you, you, tower of power live are you kidding me Wow. And it was like, it was amazing. So it was this introduction into what was possible in the realm of, of uh, being a musical artist. So that set me on my path. And when I graduated high school, I wanted out of my small town so bad I couldn't stand it for a lot of different reasons. You know, I'm not going to say crappy childhood, but it was a lot of things that I was running away from. So I got the chance to jump on the road with a rock band and we spent about three years in Western Canada getting their chops, you know, moving up from the really crappy clubs to the not so crappy clubs. Right. And I'm going to tell you this story and I'm sorry to bog down. You can edit That's this fine. if you want to for time. But we were in Calgary, Alberta, and our, the band I was with was called Section 8. And I was the front man by this time because, you know, we had a bass player. Nobody wanted to sing. So I evolved into being the front man, <laughs> you know, and I was good. I, I had a voice coach and I, I got to be good. I was uh, trying to be an entertainer. And, you know, I took my voice seriously. I was a runner. I was vegetarian. I didn't drug. I didn't drink on stage and, and you know, didn't, you know, I, I took it very seriously because because of the Theban brothers and the recording. So, you know, it's like I can this is something here. This is not just a, a, a party. So. So we're in this club in Calgary. We're on break and Wasp and Iron Maiden were touring. They did a big show at Calgary at, at the, the auditorium there. So the guys from Wasp come in. You remember Wasp, oh, right? Oh, yeah. Yep. So Blackie Lawless and three other guys from Wasp come in. They sit at the back table in this bar that we're playing. So we go on break and I get my nerve up and I walk up to him <laughs> and I tap him on the shoulder. I said, um, I called him Mr. Lawless, probably pissed him off, but. I said, I said, I, I love you guys' music and your MTV videos. And this, I'm, I'm, you know, I just want to say I'm a big fan. Um, have you got any advice for me? Oh, no. And he, he looked at me and he said, what are you doing here? And I said, um, I, what do you mean? He said, what are you doing here? And, and he was pissed. I could see it in his face. And I said, well, we're getting the band tight and we're writing some songs. And we're, you know, we're going to try and get a deal and all that type of stuff. And he said, listen. If you're going to be in the music business, you better be where the business is. Now, F off. And he turned around, turned his back to me. And it, it took me by surprise. But again, it was a smack in the face. It was like uh, Dennis Steven uh, to listening, to, making me listen to Tower of Power. It was like, oh, my God. So within three months, I was living in Orlando, Florida. We had a management deal. We're not the same band. I found another opportunity with a band that had a management deal with um, Omni Talent Group. They used to manage um, Pat Travers, uh, Molly Hatchet, a really kick-ass group out of Miami called um, Stranger. Uh, some of the guys from Warrant before they became Warrant. And they were tied mm -hmm. to CBS Records, which doesn't exist anymore. Right. So what he said to me was this epiphany. He's like, I got to get out of Western Canada. This is not the mecca for recording music and becoming the thing that I wanted to become. So I moved down to the United States in 1984. And that started, you know, this, my, my successive starvation route <laughs> <laughs> in the States. And, um, and did that. And, and again, you know, and that was with the Nova Rex band. And uh, we had this guitar player. Uh, he, if you've ever seen the Bring the House Down uh, yeah. video, J.P. Cervoni plays upside down and backwards like Hendrix. He actually played with Buddy Miles in one of the 12 piece um, uh, jazz band that Buddy Miles had. And so oh. J.P. is the real deal. He's a producer still in L.A., a fantastic guitar player and really good songwriter. So it was me, JP, and two other guys. And now we did the Florida Club Circuit. We wrote, we did some album quality demos, and nothing ever happened. So the band breaks up. You know, consequently, I would go to work in body shops because I knew that work. And, and you know, anyway, got back together again with Nova Rex out in L.A. Uh, that video that you saw was a showcase that we got to do in Long Beach in 1987. And uh, again, some almost and never got the brass ring. We were being shopped to some Japanese record labels and the whole time getting better and doing and, and learning. And, and, you know, I, I, at the top of my game, I could stand toe to toe with any rock singer, any rock singer. I, I, I was I was in the best shape of my life. I had a four octave vocal range. I was if I could think a note, I could sing the note. And I was 
you know, and, and it's not a boast. It's just, it's just what we, what we, what we grow into, if we yeah. can take it seriously, we become better as technicians and, and musicians. And I joined a band um, from LA because I, I, you know, was, we're literally starving out there. <laughs> and the, then the band broke up again because we didn't get the deal. And, and yeah. so I joined a band called Eli based out of Tallahassee, Florida, and um, we toured with them. We were touring the Southeast, a lot of one-nighters, frat parties, big money one-nighter gigs. We were a concert club act. We had an 18-wheeler. We had five guys on the crew and five guys on the stage and big scrims and a thousand lights. And that's, this is back before LED, right? Right. So the, the, a lot we of had heat a, you on know, you every night. It was a lot of heat on us every night. So I stayed <laughs> skinny. So, <laughs> but we were, uh, we were a band and, and one of the roadies that would drive the truck in shifts quit. So the manager of the band comes up to me and he said, KT, um, one of the guys quit. You can drive a truck, right? And I said, yeah, I could drive. I could drive. I learned how to drive a Toyota Corolla on a frozen lake in Canada. I could drive anything. So <laughs> I was going to get an extra 50 bucks a week to drive, the, to drive the truck between gigs. And our MO was we're going to work Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, come back in, write and record Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday kind of thing. Because the, the manager of the band had a recording studio. And then we were going to shop and get the deal and okay. all that type of stuff, move over Van Halen. So it was a valid plan with the mechanism in place to do it. Yeah. So I started driving the truck between gigs and I denied myself vocal rest. I still wasn't drugging. I was still, I was on top of the, somewhere there's a poster that says Eli featuring the incredible KT. And it's not a brag. It's in a boast. I was, I was a really good singer and yeah. um, you know, we could do anything. And, and, uh, uh, and I started to slowly get fatigued and get tired and, and I lost some of my range. And then I started, my voice started to crack and then I couldn't do certain songs. And then I couldn't do this night or that night. And I got fired. I lost my gig and I lost my voice. I blew out my voice. I lost the whole vocal production thing. I started singing incorrectly. I lost the support mechanism. I lost that muscle memory that you have as a singer that, that teaches you how to properly produce vocally. Right. And, um, and it was over. I couldn't order through a drive through without my voice breaking. And uh, by then I was seeing this girl uh, in middle Tennessee and, um, married to her, still married to her 32 years later. And, right. um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. This November was 32, man. It's been awesome. awesome. She's, she's a fence. And, and I talk about my success. She has been beside me the whole time and, and literally part of every decision that I've ever made. Um, and it's, it's been a, a wonderful partnership. So I got to give duty credit for, for all these little successes that, that we've had along the way, because it's truly a joint effort, you know? Yeah. So I tried to be a Nashville musician. I thought, well, I can sing country. You know, I, did, I only have one octave now. I found a voice coach. I could rehabilitate a little bit. And I thought, well, it's country's easy. It's three chords and the truth. So I know three <laughs> chords and I have a reasonable facsimile of the truth. So let's try that. But then I immersed myself in the Nashville songwriting scene. And I realized that I was 30 years old and I didn't have the time to put the curve in and still be in a young man's game. And then it was over. And, and the, the, the true death knell, the last nail in the coffin was that I had a little weekend band started and trying to do some of my originals and covers and stuff like that. It fired me because my voice was inconsistent. <sighs> I got fired by my own band. So it's like, okay, I'm out. I'm out. I can't break. I can't take it anymore. I was devastated. You know, my spirit was crushed, man. <laughs> so, so it's, you know, and, and I was working in a body shop at the time. So it's like, okay, I'm going to double down on this. I'm going to double down on this because I see guys around me in the shop that are making really good money. And I want that. I want to bring that home for my family. It's time. 10 wasted years on the road, all those fake dreams that as a kid, I was so disappointed. I said, screw that. I'm going to work as hard as I can. And, and body work and, and restoration work taught me the one thing that the music industry never did. And that is the harder I worked at doing and getting my skills up and doing body work, the more it gave me back. When I realized that, it was yeah. an epiphany. It was like, okay, so I'm going to push harder and get more back. I'm going to become a better technician and make more money. And then I'm going to get a reputation and get sought after and get cherry picked for the really good paying gigs. And then the guy with a lot of money is going to have me restore his car on the side. So those types of things were so empowering and encouraging after I literally hit rock bottom from the music industry. It beat the ego out of me it beat me to death you know almost yeah. uh, it was it was um uh, it was it was a real real reset moment in my life so sorry to go down that rabbit no, hole but i wanted to tell you the, 
the whole story. I mean, you know, you've been there, right? It's a, it's an important part of, of everything we do is figuring out that at some point, no matter how bad you want the dream, maybe the dream's not what you're supposed to have. And maybe there's lessons you're learning along the way that will take you down the road you're supposed to go. Yeah. It, but it hurts in that moment. You know, I've seen so many people come into the little studio in the middle of Kansas. We were just there to record one label's blues musicians. But since it's a studio, other people would come and come in and you're watching them. And you're like, yeah, I, 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 it's awesome. You're making this record. And it's like, I know it's not going any further than this record, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. You know, Cause you're in Kansas. You're not in LA. You're not in Nashville. You're not in Austin yeah. places where music scene happens. You know, you're, you're trying to make it in the middle of nowhere, but anyway, so I, anyway, I thought it'd be a fun little tour down, uh, down music. So do you still play any, do you play bass at all anymore? Or? I have got a therapy guitar sitting up in the wall and I'll tell you this story too. So it's not completely over for music for me. So I've got yeah. guitars all over the place. They stood in the closet for a long time, but um, my producer on the truck show, Blaine Siebold, I'll never forget him and I'll, I'll love him forever for this, but his wife had a, had a weekend band and right. they lost their guitar player. So, you know, we were into the truck show probably three or four seasons by that time. He said, KT, we need a guitar player. So we want you to come and, and uh, play guitar for us. I said, <laughs> yeah, thank you. I appreciate that, but I'm not a guitar player. And um, I'm done with that. He said, no, 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 you don't understand. We want you to play guitar for us. So here's a song list. And I said, no, no, thanks. But my guitars are still in the closet. He said, okay, well, dust them off, tune them up. Here's a song list. You've got two months. And so, <laughs> and so he wouldn't take no, because he knew that somewhere inside me, there was this thing that was still back here. And he was producing and, you in a different, yeah. I mean, so he was, he knew how to, how to like, no, you're going to do this. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'd had enough, uh, enough conversations about it. And his wife was an eighties singer as well. And he knew enough people. He was kind of my age and we had, you know, kind of the same inspirations in a lot of ways. So I would shed it for, for two months solid. And, and I, I got to where I, there wasn't too many clams and I did this gig with him. And actually Chris Ryan came out to one of the gigs when he was doing the search and restore show with Tim. Yeah. And um, we played the first Friday of every month for about two and a half years at the lipstick lounge in East Nashville. Um, it's this wonderful little venue. This, uh, this, this wonderful couple owns it and really low key, um, it was a not an after hours bar, but it was a, it was a gay bar that was just really chill. It, nobody cared about anybody else. It was just come here, have a fun time. And for those reasons, a lot of Nashville heavyweights would come in there because nobody bugs anybody. So we got to jam with uh, with artists like uh, that, that would come in just off the off the off the off the tour or something like that. Go hang out at the lip. So I did that gig and be, actually became a pretty good lead guitar player. There was no Great. pretense with the band. All 80s people that, that were had the aspirations for a career at one point, and it was purely for the fun of it. And we had one night out of every month that we had to get up there. We got a chance to shine. We got a chance to do the gigs and do the fun songs again. Um, I, you know, I would sing probably three or four songs a night because that's pretty much all I've got left in me. Right. And um, and and it was just fun. And it was just fun. It, it ended when um, when the band wanted to do more than I could do because I was still doing the TV show. still running page education. My wife had a, a business at the time. She had a children's dance school that was consistently growing. I just didn't have time to do weekends anymore. Yeah. I could do one night a month, but that was all I could do. So that ended that, but it taught me how to love music again. And it taught me the right. joy of, of doing that, that again, because it's this really interesting energy that happens when you get it right. It's this exchange that happens when you, you sort of commune with an audience. It's a little bit different with a TV camera because it's <laughs> static and a little cold. But, um, but you know, interestingly enough, um, I work with the Eastwood Company, and they have me come up to their brick and mortar stores and do live seminars. And I've been doing that for, for many, many years, just like Ron Covell does. I talked to him out at SEMA. He was doing live seminars out at right. SEMA. It's been a couple of years since I've done that. But, but it's this connection that you get with a live audience. And whether you're a musician or a presenter or in public speaking, which is one of the things that I'm starting to do a little bit more of now, and it's really interesting to me. But um, that connection, I don't know, it's kind of a full circle time for me to where I'm now realizing how much I love that connection with people and with uh, getting a rhythm going, you know? Isn't it, isn't it weird how it's a completely different thing and way easier to just talk to a camera that could be seen by 6 million people than it is to be up in front of 60 people doing something like maybe that first night you got up there to play guitar. You, I, I bet that was harder for you than being on camera that day. 
I think a little <laughs> bit of pee came out. Yeah, yeah. It, you're exactly right. And once you learn how to where to look in the camera and how to yeah. trigger that in your brain where you can talk to that one spot on the camera lens like it's a person, and then right. you get that eye contact thing. Uh -huh. And that's a learned thing as well. It's not just it, I, I didn't wake up in the morning and learn how to be on TV. I studied <laughs> it. I worked hard at it. And you know, there's and I was tutored and mentored by producers and, and everybody else and made all the mistakes. So so but, but you're exactly right. Once you um once you 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 figure out that mechanism it's you don't even think about how many people because we we were really well watched on the truck show i'm proud to yeah. have been a part of that there was a lot of people that watched those episodes on power block and power nation and um and it's kind of humbling because it still carries with people still recognize me from those shows and it's really a wonderful thing that people come up and say hi it's 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 really a, a, a huge reward and it's and it's a, it's a privilege to have done that and to be recognized mm -hmm. by people and it's something that I, I i i take very seriously and and i owe people that have watched me through the years a career and and i will be forever grateful for it yeah. but um, but you're right standing up in front of 15 people talking about sanding and polishing or whatever it is yeah man you get the butterflies big right. time <laughs> Look, millions of people have watched me say this exact same thing why is it right now i'm having this feeling uh, yeah totally get that yeah yeah so, for sure well, it's awesome that the music story has come full circle with you get to go back and fall in love with it again playing those gigs that you get to play that's a great ending for that story uh um we don't want to keep you too long here we can go probably go all night here but i want to go back well, to version two <laughs> yeah we'll do this again sometime i want to cool. go back to you a little bit uh on the painting stuff if someone's going to take on a project of painting their car themselves and, and you know, they're not going to go for award winning show quality. They just want it to look nice and go out and have a cruiser. What's the, the, the one most important thing you can say to them? Wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's hard to distill into one thing. I'm sure. <laughs> no, the, the most important thing that I can say to anybody is that put in the reps, do the practice. You know, when I'm training people, whether it's th this high level contract that I have or or whether I'm training somebody for uh, uh, this company moved into our area that um, that makes guitars, Veritas guitars. And we had mm -hmm. their their crew come in and do a do a paint session. And it was a three day course. And um, and we start with craft paint on cardboard. And we practice and we understand what that that equipment does and what it doesn't do and what it's supposed to do. And and so okay. when I say put in the reps, it's practice. Instead of painting your fenders on your car or the hood of your cars first, go to the body shop, get some takeoff panels, get some materials, buy a little bit of extra. It doesn't have to be the most expensive stuff, but buy decent materials. There's all kinds of really good relatively low cost materials, urethane primers with a hardener, um, clear coats, single stages, whatever, buy some stuff and, and practice spraying, get used to that equipment and find out what your limits are and get better at it. And then understand more about the chemistry, do some sort of training and believe it or not, PPG. And I, I think Exalta is starting, but PPG will still let lay people into their training courses. If they've got scheduling, of course, COVID has messed things up, but you can get into these high level courses. Most community colleges have an auto body course of some kind. Not that you got to go and get a two year degree, but you do, you have to practice. And with that practice, you will become more familiar with um, either the limitations of your equipment or that you have enough equipment and that your technique is going to get better. With that, invest in some sort of an education, whether it's YouTube. I don't care if it's YouTube. It doesn't matter to me. There's, uh, there's great video sites on there. You can, you can find good information on YouTube. The problem I have with YouTube is not the information on there. It's how long it takes to find what's really valuable. Right. So, so how so many that's bad videos I, do you have to watch before you get the one good one too? You know, oh, you, well, the answer is nine. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So uh, yeah, I go down this road with electronic stuff and with mechanical oh, yeah. stuff because, you know, because I'm a paint and body guy, but I'm, I'm a student of, of everything else. So um, so that's the thing, too. And, and YouTube is fine. If you can get somebody to mentor you, that's fine. So the, the number one most important thing is a um, practice, 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 practice. Good. B, understand the requirements of your equipment compared to um, 
uh, the requirements of your spray gun compared to the air compressor equipment that you have. There's alternatives out there. There's airless sprayers. There's turbine sprayers. If you don't want to invest in a giant air compressor, then there's other ways to do it. Um, get on the auto body groups that are on Facebook. Now, some of them are kind of brutal. Social media can be a giant dick sometimes, but, right. um, but and sorry for potty mouth, but um, but but yeah. sometimes, yeah, sometimes um, you know that you got to sift through a lot of really sarcastic answers to get somebody that really wants to to provide you good information. So yeah. it, immerse yourself into that. It's not going to take long. It's not going to take six months worth of stuff. But get enough of a foundation to where you know kind of ballpark what you're going to do, and then throw yourself into it. Don't be afraid to fail. The best painters on the planet. I was in this master certification class for people in that are the dedicated Exalta paint users. The instructor leads with how many times he screwed up. Nobody gets out of here free. Everybody makes mistakes. So get used to the fact that you're going to screw some stuff up and then you're going to get better. So it's it's like anything else. Like we you know, circle back to we said it's not a gift. It's not a thing that you just wake up in the morning and you can paint a car. It's an acquired skill. So go through the motions, go through the reps and acquire the skill. It's not that hard and I can prove it. <laughs> and paintucation.com is where I'm going to tell people to go there. Go there, check out the uh, Paintucation University, check out the DVDs. There's lots of options to get a lot of help. Like I said, there's free stuff there as well if you want to check that out. And then uh, I just want to say thank you, Kevin. Thank you for taking your time out even to do this. And uh, I, oh, I guess there's one more thing. Tim Strange. Was the other ah. the other guys I asked? I I had to I had to get this one there. He goes, ask him about a certain impression of a Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live character. Oh my gosh! Okay, <laughs> so yeah. And by the way, Tim Strange, if you don't know who he is, look him up. Tim's a great guy, and he's become a really good friend. He and his wife are, are dear friends. Awesome. And man. and they're awesome people, and you know this. But um, Tim is uh, he's a, a he's I'm going to call him a living legend. He's mm -hmm. he's had over 200 cars on the covers of magazines. He's a, he's a well-respected hot rod builder, and he's he's been personally responsible for my growth and um, my growing f uh, in, in, from my growth in hot rodding and things like that. So I'll be grateful to him forever. He's he's a he's a great he's a great inspiration for being a good guy and a good friend and mm -hmm. as heck too. Oh yeah. But okay, so. We're, I don't know if you remember uh, Chris Kattan on Saturday Night Live. Yeah. So he was Mr. Peepers, this little creature man that had shorts. He would jump up on the bench and eat these apples like a like a little uh, Reese's monkey and then throw the core out and spit the the, the peels everywhere. Yeah. So t Tim bugs me about being short. I'm not short. I'm altitude challenged. So Tim is not. He's tall. Right. So he kept calling me Mr. Peepers and stuff like that. So one of these, we're on the search and restore set. And there was these giant antenna towers just basically giving uh, kind of a perimeter around this open air warehouse that was the set for doing all these car builds that Tim um, orchestrated. And, you know, Tim throws me an apple. He said, all right, Mr. Peepers, go to work. So I said, OK. So I climbed this antenna tower. It's a 20 foot tower. <laughs> And, and so I climbed to the top of it and I'm perched up on top of it, squatting down and I'm going through this apple and eating it. And there's apple rinds <laughs> flying out of my mouth. And there's this little semicircle of people looking up at me, laughing their butts off because it's this stupid. I'm bringing this SNL skit to life out of the corner of my eye. I see the executive producer of RTM Productions, the CEO <laughs> of the entire company in his three-piece suit with some of sales executives and clients <laughs> coming in and he stops and he just raises his head and he looks at me while I'm doing this. I didn't stop. I kept on with Mr. <laughs> Peepers and spitting apple pieces out just because I figured, well, I'm fired anyways. I'm it's it's going to be work. funnier to keep going. So keep going. <laughs> <laughs> what a swan song. And he just shook his head and walked away. <laughs> And I didn't get fired. He never yeah. mentioned it, never brought it up to me. I don't know why. Oh, and the career <laughs> keeps going. <laughs> and the career keeps going. Speaking of, I, I want to throw some shout outs. I'm, I'm involved in a show now called Hands on Cars. It's okay. on, actually, we have some on Amazon Prime. The download digital lug, it's the digital lug app. 
Ian Johnson from Extreme Off Road. Um, he's now on a four wheeler TV on um, on Motor Trend. Uh -huh. He started his own digital production company, and okay. there's going to be a whole family of shows. So the digital lug app is free. All of our programming is free. It's dedicated how to stuff, just like I'm used to. There's no wrench throwing, no garbage. We do build cool cars because it's fun to build cool cars, and we throw some good information there along the way. We're so excited to be a part of that too. And also, I've been a freelance writer forever, and I'm just involved in this. Like yesterday, we were shooting. There's a car up at PRI that we're doing. It's a 72 Challenger that is getting the Scoggin Dicky Hellcrate engine in it. So really interesting build. But the, the resurrection of Carcraft magazine is happening on video. John McGann is the host of okay. it. He was my uh, producer, my uh, uh, editor in Carcraft. I was a freelancer there for about six years. And, uh, and it's really cool to be uh, part of that mark being resurrected as a freelance writer. Uh, so that's going to be on video on the Motor Trend app as well. But there's the, the way TV is changing is really exciting because you can get it everywhere and you can get it for free. And we're allowed now to finally be the producers that we always wanted to be and create the content that we think is what um, is, is, is what the viewers are telling us what we want to do. So please, um, you know, look those things up, download the digital log app and watch, watch us build some really fun stuff, man. Very cool. I actually didn't know about that one yet. So I have to get that downloaded and do some, do some uh, watch of that. So cool. I, again, I can't say thanks enough for taking your time to be on here and uh, of all the stuff you've done over the years. Again, that's, it means a ton to me that we continue to teach people how to do some of the stuff themselves. So there is a less of a barrier of entry to get somebody into dragging some old car out of a field, get it on the road and, and take it out and enjoy it. It doesn't have to be a Riddler winner. It doesn't have to be you know a showstopper. It just has to be something that puts a smile on your face. And then yeah. knowing how to make it better is, a, is a, a, a crazy important part of that. Yeah. And when people have those successes, that brings the smiles it brings connections it brings community and as you know travis this whole industry is about relationships it's not about cars or parts it's about the people we meet along the way like you and and i'm i want to thank you so much for having me on your cast and um and it's it's been really fun talking to you man yeah you too it's, it's the pleasure is all mine I, I really appreciate it and uh we'll have to find something next time we'll we'll find something about chris and, and tim we'll have to talk about i'm sure we've got plenty of stories oh yeah yeah we got some stuff <laughs> <laughs> next time we talk to chris ask him about doing the live podcast in a bar in kansas we, we did oh that man night, and i waited till we all had a few drinks in us too so it's it extra <laughs> special <laughs> yeah yeah mr ryan has got some stories that he doesn't tell very often for, you know sure, this. for sure all right kevin thank you for being on everybody uh make sure you go check out paint education uh all over social media i'll put links in the uh, show notes for the page for the uh, podcast here uh and Thank you again, sir. You just have yourself a great evening, and hopefully we'll talk to you again soon. You do the same, my friend. You take care. Thank you. Bye. That was a blast. There's a ton more that we could have talked about, but I looked down at the, at the recorder and I was like, oh, my gosh, we've been going for quite a while here. I better let this man have his life back. So uh, thank you again, Kevin. That was amazing, and I'm sure we will talk again soon. Folks, make sure you go check out his Paint Education series. Like I said, there's some free stuff there if you want to free stuff. Uh, if you want to get the good stuff, you know, as I say it, uh, yeah, there, there is a little premium to pay, but that's the same in everything in life. If, if you if you want people to produce good content, you have to support it. Um, uh, so that's why I do Patreon. That's why a bunch of other people out there charge for their for their content because hey, it costs money to do this, and uh, and it's awesome to see he's been doing it for this long and has continued doing it. So you know he he really loves teaching people, and I hope you got a feel through this interview a little bit a little bit more of who he is based off of uh, this versus what you see on the TV show, you know, on the TV show, it's always kind of pretty cut and produced and stuff. So and, and enjoy the video and or the podcast here. If you want to watch on the video, it will be on YouTube, by the way, on the Roy Boy Productions YouTube channel. Uh, I'm trying to put all these up here as videos so people can check those out as well. Okay. So that was great. That was a really good time. Let's talk about uh, what's going on in the world. You know what? Uh, a lot of people have been talking lately about uh, the Hellcat is not going to be produced anymore. That engine, that crate motor is not going to be produced anymore as Dodge moves towards a a, a more um, eco-friendly electric car version of, of life. And I'm like, okay, well, I mean, it's, it's part of life. Things will change. Uh, people ask, what do you think about that? I'm like, you know, I couldn't afford the engine in the first place. I love that it exists. I love that some people could do it. It's not in my budget, but I love that it's out there. Uh, Ford just released their brand new platform and it kind of, 
I don't think they'd put that much R and D and that much effort into a brand new flat platform from them to kill it. So I, I don't know that the Hellcat going away as a package is going to be the end of Dodge producing high horsepower engines. I think it's might just be time for a, something different to happen. We'll see how that works out. Um, I've been doing a lot of, of I, I almost said studying. It's not studying. I've been watching a lot of YouTube videos, uh, different car people, different woodworking stuff. I've really been getting into that lately. And uh, one thing I'm really learning is we all have a little different way to do everything we do. So I've been really into uh, traditional hot rod and custom cars for a very long time. And that's what really trips my trigger. That's what I love to see. But I know not everybody does. So if there's anything that I'm doing over the years that you like, Hey, Travis, you never really talked about this. You never really showed this. Let me know. Maybe it's not something that's right in front of me in my wheelhouse, but maybe we can still have somebody on the podcast. We can still learn things about other facets of the hot rod and custom car hobby uh, industry that uh, may make us all better. You know, I just wanted to throw that out there. I I'm watching all these videos from woodworkers and upholsters and stuff that I don't know how to do because I want to learn how is it done. Also, does it look like something that I enjoy doing? Maybe I want to try that sometime. So that's what I've been doing. And hopefully that's the kind of thing with like with uh, our guest, Kevin uh, Tate's on this episode. Maybe, maybe you get a little of that as well. Like I said, you don't have to want to do your own paint job to be able to get something out of watching the videos. So at least you know how it's done and how much it takes to get it done. So uh, I, I don't really want to get into too much stuff because I just had a great time tonight and I'm having, I don't, I've been ranting on this podcast too much lately. So I'm going to stop ranting for a little bit. Maybe we'll do one night where we're, uh, we'll go back to the drunk episode. We haven't done a drunk episode in a while. So maybe one night we'll uh, grab some, uh, grab some whiskey and I'll let you ask anything you want and I will answer it. And then we'll see what happens after the fact. So folks, that's it really. This one's going to be a short one on the outro. Uh, stay safe. Don't die. I'll see you at a show. Thanks for listening to another episode of Chrome Pipes and Pinstripes. If you got to this point, that means you listened to the whole show, and I appreciate that. So I want to throw one thing out here. If you dig what I do with these podcasts, you dig what I do with RoyBoyProductions.com, please consider going over to Patreon.com slash RoyBoyProductions, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash RoyBoyProductions. That's where if you feel like it, you can say, hey, you know what? I'll throw I'll throw Roy Boy a dollar a month or five dollars a month or ten dollars a month because I appreciate what he does. Talking about myself in the third person sounds really weird. So, you know, it's forgive me for all the weirdness here. If you dig what I do, please come over here and help support what I do because it takes a lot of money to to go to these events, to stay in the hotels, to to buy this expensive equipment. All of my equipment is getting pretty old. So <laughs> The, the podcast recorder right now is held together with uh, with just prayer. Uh, I think that's the only thing making it continue to work. And I will need to buy a new one at some point this year. And they're, they're quite pricey. So I'm not trying to complain. Just saying thank you for all the people who have helped me over the years uh, by buying hats and shirts and stuff. I'll have new shirts out this year. And uh, in the meantime, you can go over to RoyBoyProductions.com. Check out all the stuff I have there. If you feel like throwing a couple dollars a month at me, I really would appreciate it. It's patreon.com slash Roy Boy Productions. Um, and uh, I'll work out some stuff that the people who donate there get a little bit, of, little bit of heads up and get some stuff ahead of time. All right. Thanks for listening. Have yourself a great day. Bye-bye now. Well, somebody's got to ride this dinosaur.